an eighth special presentation. This week on Artbeat Nation, a writer-director who makes his own rules. You can tell the story that you want to tell without any interference from anyone. The musician who discovered life after the day the music died. I haven't been outrageously famous, so I've been able to do many things that I wanted to do. An actress whose latest role seems tailor-made for her. That kind of fortitude and um, perseverance that that takes, I can absolutely 100% relate to that. And we take you behind the scenes of Annie. To be a good costume designer, you have to be interested in everything. It's all ahead on Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. Veteran filmmaker Edward Burns has spent much of his career championing new ways to create and distribute independent movies. Raphael P. Roman talks to Burns about the many films he's written, directed, and starred in, including some of his newest. Now, Ed, you spent all of $9,000 shooting your latest film, Newlyweds. Uh, why does a 17-year veteran filmmaker and a Hollywood film star make a movie for $9,000? Uh, the primary reason really is to sort of protect the process. You know, um, you can tell the story that you want to tell without any interference from anyone. Usually that interference comes from someone who is going to write you a check for several million dollars. If I am going to work with someone else's money and a substantial budget, I may not be able to cast the folks I want, uh, I may have my ending changed, I might not be able to music, they're going to change the title. If I'm going to make a movie for $25,000, like a whole Mullen, different series of compromises. Yeah, right? Exactly. And those compromises are, you know, you're not going to work with movie stars. Um, you can't afford a steady cam. You can't afford 50 feet of track, let alone two feet of track. However, the thing that I will get is total creative control. Uh -huh. So I've been looking at those two lists of compromises, and in these last two films I've decided I prefer to work with these. Now, how does a budget of $9,000 or a low budget like that, how does that shape the film? First of all, how does it shape the script, et cetera? Um, with Newlyweds, after um, I plotted out what was going to happen to the characters, I had to figure out, well, you know, where do they live and where do they work? I had a friend who owns a gym, so Buzzy, the character I played, all right, he's going to be a trainer. Um, I have uh, a few friends who own a bunch of restaurants, so Caitlin Fitzgerald's character, Katie, becomes a restaurateur. And the idea was throw the actors into a live environment. If we're going to pretend that we're making this doc, Let's throw them in with real folks. And sometimes we had sort of funny moments where uh, someone on the street might interact with one of the actors. Uh, that stayed in the film. We had another moment with Caitlin Fitzgerald where she was on the phone in a scene behind the bar of her restaurant. Uh, there was a guy who had a couple of drinks in the restaurant and kept interrupting her trying to get a drink and finally said, look, I don't actually work here. We're shooting this film. And the great thing about the size of this camera and the fact that it's a three-man crew is even if someone was sitting two tables over, they had no clue as to what we were doing. Um, and the actors all talked about how that'll, it freed them up for maybe a different style of acting. You know, at, when I called cut, an army of folks did not come in to fix their hair, to fix the wardrobe, you know, mess with the props. You just, you stayed in character the whole time. We didn't get married, then who knows, we would have got to know each other, started a career maybe. You know? Right, and then you never would have married me. Yeah, I hear you. No, I hear what you're saying. Look, you've been married for 18 years, you know, you got that terrific kid, he's at a great school. I would say, like, I don't know if it, if it ended today, you could probably call it a success, right? 2007, you were the first filmmaker to open your film, Purple Violets, on iTunes. Uh, since then, the movies you've made, Nice Guy Johnny and Newlyweds, you 
are essentially bypassing theatrical release and opening them uh, directly on uh, the internet and on video on demand. Um, why? A, a couple of reasons. Um, when we were trying to sell Purple Violets, we got a distribution offer that had sadly become uh, a little bit more of the norm, where they offer you a no advance partnership. So basically, they're going to give you no money, and they're going to take 50% of the film. And in success, supposedly, you will see half of the profits. Hollywood bookkeeping being what it is, um, you never see any of that money. The other thing that had happened um, was around 06, you started to see that the theatrical business for a specialized or independent film had uh, started to decline pretty dramatically. The audience is at home and not going to the theater. So why don't we gamble here and see if we release this film exclusively on iTunes? Maybe we can actually make more money um, uh, than we would if we were to sell it with this uh, um, no advance partnership. So the difference was our opening weekend, we could play to the art house crowd in New York and LA, or we could be pumped into 45 million homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, the success of Newlyweds and the numbers we did in our first two weeks is the, my greatest success since the Brothers McMullen. Right. If you want to look at it in just in, in terms of how many people have already seen the film. But Ed, you know, you're a well-known filmmaker. Yes. You have a proven track record. A beginner filmmaker, they don't have that advantage. Does this model work for them? I keep telling, because I go to film schools and talk to kids a lot, and I keep saying, you know, they'll say, well, I, I don't know that I can get my film onto iTunes um, or, or onto VOD. And I said, well, guys, what's the alternative? When I met Brothers McMullen, I made it to try and get an agent. I didn't make it to have a theatrical release. You know, and it was much harder back then to make your first film, you know, uh, uh, shooting on film and, and trying to buy recan film stock. You know, you guys have access to cameras that cost under $3,000. Um, why not just go make your movie? And it's up to you to fight the good fight and market the hell out of it and use Facebook and Twitter and email blasts and do all the things that indie rock bands have been doing for 10 years. But, but let me ask you something. Do you think that a Brothers McMullen... Uh, which won the, the big prize in Sundance and then went on to make millions. Could, could that happen in this film environment? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, th these filmmakers um, can still submit their films to all of the great festivals, Tribeca, Telluride, Toronto, Sundance, and, you know, Hollywood still shows up at these festivals hoping to find that next big thing. Patrick, our relationship has run its course. I think we're better off going out and... Uh, Finding new people, new experiences, ideas. Hey, hey, I don't need any new ideas, all right? I'm confused enough already. As you know, your films are very often compared to Woody Allen's films. What do you think of that comparison? I mean, completely flattered by it. Um, you know, when Mick Mullen came out, they said, oh, Long Island, Woody Allen, <laughs> which, you know, my mom got such a thrill out of because, and I did as well, because, you know, Woody Allen is the reason I make movies. Really? You know, um, when I got out of school, um, the first screenplays I, I started to write was, you know, um, Tarantino had come out with Reservoir Dogs. Right. And I was blown away by that. So I probably wrote three rip-offs of Reservoir Dogs. Like, like every filmmaker. Like, every, at the like time. every filmmaker in the early '90s. <laughs> Sent them out to Hollywood. They were rejected. Um, and clearly, it wasn't what I should be writing. Uh, and that's when I said, you know, all right, I'm gonna sit down and write sort of my version of a Woody Allen film, a small, talky uh, character comedy. And I started with. Uh, Brothers McMullen. Moving forward, um, you know, Sidewalks of New York. Absolutely, that is a homage ripoff <laughs> of husbands and wives. Are you a model? If I were a model, why would I be sitting here studying right now? <laughs> That's very funny. Well, well, you should be if you're not, because you're very beautiful. You have a very different look. It's not. A, I mean, you're not a classic beauty. I think you have the look of the new millennium. The look of the new millennium. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Griffin, by the way. Ashley. Nice to meet you, Ashley. Beautiful Hi. name. So what do you say? Thanks. Will you let me take you out sometime? Or? Are you married? Married? 
Why do you say that? Where do you get that from, that I'm married? Because you have a ring on your finger? Isn't that a ring? Yeah, yeah. Well, technically I'm married, yeah, but I'm, I'm not really married. How important is the New York City background to your films? I mean, very important. I've, I've said before, you know, New York City is the greatest co-star any actor can have. Um, for me, it, it probably stems from, you know, I'm a kid who grows up in Valley Stream, Long Island, and, you know, my parents, you know, it, it was always about looking west. You need to get, you know, over the river and into the big city where, you know, you're, you're, that's where you're gonna make your dreams come true. Um, and then that I chose to go into writing and filmmaking, and this is the indie film capital of the world. You know, this is the place where my creative dreams come true as well. The other reason is, you know, the city is constantly inspiring you. You know, I still take the train all the time, and I just sit there and I watch folks and listen to folks. I told someone a story recently just about like, you know, listening in on a great conversation, two people next to me, and now you just pull out your iPhone, and I'm just basically taken <laughs> down. Yeah, yeah, no, script. absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, Ed, congratulations on Newlyweds. It's hey, a great film. You. Appreciate that. Congratulations that. on all and everything. Cool. Thank you. Next, musician Don McLean is famous for lamenting the day the music died in his hit song, American Pie. But the singer found that even after the song dropped off the charts, his career lived on. A world is out there. Let's put that guitar on your shoulder and that's it. And they were singing. Don McLean's American Pie is the fifth greatest song of the century, according to a recording industry NEA poll. And if that's pretty much all you know him for, well, that's okay with him. The good thing about it has been I haven't been outrageously famous so I've been able to do many things that I wanted to do rather than be uh, stuck with a certain Don McLean sound. His versatility has taken Don all over the globe and created a philosophical observer with a message. If you're as fortunate as I am you can travel the world and learn about other countries and other people and come back to America and see America in a different light. The country's changing. It's, we, want to, we want to do less instead of do more. We want to challenge ourselves less. Roosevelt wanted to walk to the end of the driveway, you know. We never wanted to be seen in a wheelchair. He was never giving up, never quitting his fight to, to walk. Now, I try to see it as a, you know, as a, as just as a citizen, you know, rather than somebody that knows more than anybody else, which I certainly don't. I have so many good things uh, because of music, because of the audience out there has given me this life. I'm very thankful. And then I just kept going. As I say, I, I went, the door would open and I'd walk through it. And now it's been 44 years and I've been walking through doors, sometimes into them. Don McLean just finished a 40th anniversary tour through Europe. To find out more about him and his music, visit don-mclean.com. Many people have told the story of Abraham Lincoln, but the movie Lincoln, which opened in theaters November 2012, brings light to some of the lesser known but extraordinary people in Lincoln's life. Steve Adovato talks to actor Gloria Rubin about her role in the movie and the close ties she felt to her character. Hi, I'm Steve Adovato coming to you from our Tish W. Enneke Studios right here in Lincoln Center. It is my honor to introduce Gloria Rubin, who is an actor singer activist and she is appearing in the movie Lincoln she plays Elizabeth Keckley yes and uh, this is a very powerful movie and this role is very important to you um, set it up for us Elizabeth is whom? Elizabeth uh, was an extraordinary woman um, in regards to who she was to the Lincolns mm. she was Mary Todd Lincoln's uh, personal modiste dressmaker design maker and confidant and best friend actually for the four years that the Lincolns were in the White House and for many years after that when I had first heard of the role I I'm embarrassed to say I really am embarrassed to say I hadn't even heard of Elizabeth Keckley and Not then, many people did indeed but uh, I think that after this film comes out you know a lot of people will be more curious to, to know about her life I I know that um, you know, from, from all of the research that I did, the books that I read, and the road trip that I took, I planned and, and did a research road trip to document the first 25, 30 years of her life. Why? And that, 
Well, there were so many areas that I had read about where she, you know, where she was born, where she was, where she uh, was was raised, where she was, you know, she was born into slavery, and and her biological father was her master, and they lived just outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia, which is where we filmed. And throughout her first 25, 30 years of life, she was, you know, part of that family in the way that at 14 years old she was given as a wedding gift to the eldest legitimate mm -hmm. son. And that's how they would keep the slave family as a part of, you know, the, the, the legitimate family. And so um, the, her half-brother, whom she was a slave to, uh, he and his wife moved to different areas of Virginia and North Carolina. And um, I wanted to walk the ground where Elizabeth walked. There's nothing like being on the ground where they once walked. There's just, there's just nothing else like it. You know, in preparing for the show and, uh, you know, reading about you, and you have a very impressive background in the industry. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that <clears throat> struck me was that in the research for doing this, it kept referring to the fact that you got so close to this role yeah. that in many ways you, you, you relate it to Elizabeth on a very deep level. Very much so. Talk about that. Why? I think that there are a lot of emotional parallels between the two of us. Um, I was somewhat born into a second family, and my father was, was married pre prior to marrying my mother. He had five children, and then he met my mother, and you know his first wife had died, and then we met, met, my, met and married my mother. And so I always had felt like I was part of you know a, a fa the first family that didn't really embrace us. There was a certain kind of disconnect and a feeling of not belonging that I had always felt. That you did not belong. Yeah, definitely. To the family that you were with. To, to the, to the the, the, the extended family. Got it. As obviously Elizabeth did not quite really belong. Mm. Um, the her experience as a young woman, you know, being uh, raped. Uh, I I've had a, a similar experience. The kind of fortitude that she had. Mm. Um, in order to, I can't even imagine, I can, I can imagine, I can barely tap into it, but in order to become a successful businesswoman uh, in, in the 1860s to become Mary Todd Lincoln's personal, you know, dressmaker, her like this, emotionally, that kind of fortitude and um, perseverance that that takes, I can absolutely 100% relate to that. We are, Elizabeth and I are completely um, uh, self-made women right out of the gate. Um, the aspect of her that was uh, uh, an emotional caretaker in order for Elizabeth to be a successful dressmaker, particularly at that time, her clientele, of course, were um, politicians' wives or high society women who were oftentimes emotionally volatile. And Elizabeth had this way about her. She knew how to kind of be the equanimate, the, the equanimous one so that she would, you know, her experience with these women would, would enable these women to be their calmest and to, for them to feel their best and and then that of course would help Elizabeth's business in, mm. in, in the long run. Very savvy businesswoman. Um, Is that you? Savvy in business? I. You've done well in the I, industry. I have but you know sometimes I let my heart I, well more often than not I let my <laughs> heart lead the way and maybe that's not so good with business sometimes but uh, but yet, can, can, can you? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah. In getting ready for this, is there a part of you? By the way, this is a Spielberg project. Yes. I, I'm sorry I didn't mention that before. Yes. Uh, minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about being good in business. <laughs> can you get too close to a role, to a character, too deep? Yeah, I, um, I, I, I have to. There's no other way for me to do it. I just, I can't help myself. To find out more about the movie and about actor Gloria Rubin, visit her website, GloriaRubin.com. To bring a story to life on stage, it takes a team of people to help actors play the part, sound the part, and look the part. Costume designer Susan Hilferty does just that in the Broadway revival of Annie the Musical. She takes us into her workshop and shows us that it requires more than a good fashion sense to bring these characters to life. Hi, I'm Susan Hilferty. I'm a costume designer and I'm designing the new production of Annie. People are always surprised at what a costume designer really does. They have ideas about being a fashion designer, about clothes, or somebody who only does pretty dresses. 
What I like to tell people is that I'm a storyteller. And my medium is clothing. So what I'm doing is trying to identify specific things about a character in relationship to the story that everybody is trying to tell. So the way I begin is by reading the play and listening to the music. The story of Annie, I know, takes place in New York City. I know that I'm going to have very rich people and very poor people. My job is to create the people who live in my New York City. Because in fact, I have to invent this world. As you can see by my space, I love books. And books to me are a great way for me to look for inspiration. The other thing that's really important is that you touch things. So it is easy to look at a picture of a dress, but if you actually want to understand what that dress was and how it was made, you have to feel it. So I sit at my table, I start to sketch, I use my research, I have already had a conversation with the actor and we've talked about how we want to transform. I have in my mind visions of colors and textures and then I do the drawing. A lot of my work is drawing because I get to think visually. So the drawing is something in which I explore what a garment might look like. As soon as I have a sketch, I take it right to the people who are going to make the clothes. And the makers will include a cobbler and a dressmaker, dyers, painters, a milliner, who's somebody who makes the hats. And then we start to move forward. We start to build an idea, sketch in 3D, what the costume will look like. Every single actor will come in for at least three fittings. And we call them fittings because that's what we're doing, is we're going to fit all of the pieces together. We are looking at these variations and hoping that they'll all go together to make the vision that I've already put together when I did my sketch in the first place. I find that costume designers in the theater come from every different kind of background. Some of them were interested in fashion, some were interested in history, some were interested in art. What I do find is that to be a good costume designer, you have to be interested in everything. History classes, what we do is all about history. It's about storytelling. Read plays, read books, draw. You need to be feeling things fabrics, and I don't care if it's knitting or sewing or jewelry making or fixing a car, all of these things make you connect your hands and your brain. And that's really the most important thing about being any kind of designer. If you want to be an architect, if you want to design clothes, if you want to design anything, the one thing that we all have in common is that we work with our hands and we take that from our hands and bring it to our heads and our eyes. I am so excited to be designing this new version of Annie. It is a great musical, it's got great characters, it's about New York, it's so many things that I can celebrate. You when you're watching the performance are seeing a window, but if you imagine outside of the window, there are all of the stage hands, all the wardrobe people, the stage management, all the makers of the clothes and the scenery, whose skill and work has brought it all together for you to be able to enjoy this performance of Annie. For more fun and educational information and Annie activities, go to the Annie the Musical website at AnnieTheMusical.com and click on the Fun and Games tab. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to AIF from viewers like you. Thank you.